Hi there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the oldest artifacts that have been found in China and what they tell us about the oldest civilization that existed before the advent of writing and with the advent of writing. Some of the oldest artifacts that have been found in China are from the Ajiao culture that is found in the interior of China far to the west in what we call the Loess Plateau. In this fertile region, we see these extraordinary ceramic vessels that look like they are the product of a professional potter's guild, somebody who has skilled and specializes in pottery making. These intricate designs show uh, an incredible sophistication. We see kind of these symmetry but kind of balanced but flowing like the flow of water or wind, eddies of current, a sense of movement and change probably associated with ideas of fertility. You can see later on how this idea of flow and change are a part of sort of ancient ideas of prosperity. Here we see one of the earliest Neolithic bronze knife, also from the Anqiao culture. Bronze working in China developed about the same time as bronze working elsewhere in the world. But again, one of the things we notice about China is not that they got bronze working from elsewhere. These objects are clearly indigenously developed and indigenously derived, not based on a technology that they picked up from another culture. Out of the Matiao culture, we have one of the oldest uh, cultures where we're starting to sense a kind of idea of nobility and royalty, this idea of the Hongshan culture, where we start to see these jade objects, including this extraordinary pig dragon. Now, the pig dragon clearly relates in some ways morphologically to the idea of the serpent dragon. But it usually has this sort of pig-like snout, suggesting a kind of fertility symbol, the pig being a domesticated creature that would uh, symbolize abundance and wealth. And then the dragon, which has traditionally been associated with this idea of rain and fertility of the sky. So something sort of an earth creature and a sky creature. It's also this kind of coiling shape, curling up uh, in a way, in this sort of fetal way, it creates again this idea of growth and burgeoning sense of fertility. The circle is also, again, it's very powerful, this idea of a coil or spiraling um, images and ideas, the idea of wealth and prosperity. These are all speculations. We don't have writings from this time period. We don't know what they exactly meant. And the image of the pig dragon eventually fades and or morphologically changes into other symbols and ideas later on. Here's another jade piece uh, from the Hongshan culture where you can start to see a much more elaborated and elongated tail and snout of this pig dragon iconography. Now, jade is an exceptional idea in China. It is a stone that is very hard and is very difficult to work. You cannot carve it like you would or chisel it like you would some stones. It's, it would snap and break. So very carefully, very slowly, people cut it with a kind of measure of sand and wire. So the wet sand is put in a groove and it's rubbed until it slowly abrades and creates the shapes and filing down. It is an extraordinarily time-consuming process to cut and shape jade. And so we can see from the Hongshan culture, there must have been artisans, specialists who could devote countless hours to the shaping and making of these jade objects. The hole in its center probably meant that it was worn as an emblem or a symbol of power or royalty or nobility. Again, we cannot say for certain, but it is clear evidence of great wealth and a kind of social stratification existing in China way back in the 
hundred to 2900 BCE. Other symbols we find in ancient China, which give this sort of mystery to their meanings, is this extraordinary chong shape, which is a cylinder with these squared edges. The cylinder is open at both ends, suggesting that something must have passed through it, were offerings made, things poured through the chong as a way of purification, some people have suggested. Its utility and function is unknown, but quite a number of these have been found at this time. The chong as a shape and symbol would continue through the centuries, but its meaning and its original purpose is now lost to us. The idea of the circle we've talked about is probably also a kind of a symbol of fertility. We see this enter into a more simple and elegant solution in what's called the B disc. The B disc is just a, a flat wafer of jade and it's cut in this sort of intricate way. The circle is a symbol of the sky and so the jade is believed to be a piece of the sky. So you're creating this shaped disc as a way of saying, this is the sky. It is the sky. To hold on to jade is to hold on a piece of the sky. And since the gods and ancestors live in the sky, holding on to jade is holding on to something that is very close to the gods and might even offer ideas of longevity or prosperity as it is in a close proximity to the gods. When we start to see what is often referred to now as the first sort of dynasty that people have written about, we have no writings from this time, but later dynasties sometimes refer to the Xia dynasty. And up until fairly recently, we didn't really have any archaeological evidence to suggest the Xia dynasty really existed. But now more and more um, archaeological evidence points to a kind of stratified society with a noble people who are working in um, you know, along the river of the the Yangtze River. Here we see um, the history has been recorded and passed down by a historian by the name of Sima Qian, who is the grand astrologer, who had a job that didn't have a lot of status in the Han Dynasty. So he set himself to write a history of the past from what records he can find. And it's this Sima Qian's kind of compilation of legends and lore of the past is sort of brought together. And this becomes sort of one of the first history books. So now we're talking about some of the Han Dynasty, which would be about the, you know, the first century AD or CE you start to see some record of these earlier dynasties, the Xia dynasty. One of the ways in which we have preserved at this time is a number of artifacts that are put in tombs. And so these are called Ningqi. They are tomb artifacts that are given to the deceased as a way of honoring them and uh, demonstrating their wealth so that in the afterlife their spirit can live with the same kind of luxury that they had during this life. It also is the idea that the ancestor will go and provide a kind of wealth or benefit back to the people who are honoring them. These objects we see in the tombs are made of bronze. This is called a jia vessel. We see a tripod base. Tripod bases have, again, a um, strong symbolic value of the idea of fertility. Many of these objects were meant uh, and seem to have held a kind of wine, which is sort of a mixture of grapes and uh, other herbs to create a kind of wine-like drink. This is also uh, a vessel found in the Xia dynasty. It's only when we get to the Shang Dynasty that we start to actually get real historical records. And this is where writing begins to emerge. We have these oracle bones called Jiaguan, the script 
where people have written questions to the gods and then they heat these bones, typically either a turtle breastplate or the scapula of an ox. And then by heating the bone, it cracks in certain ways. Specialists then read the cracks and then they would write their answers, what they saw the gods, how the gods would respond to these questions based on the way the cracks would break through the words. So writing in the Shang Dynasty very early on becomes this way of communicating with the gods, becomes this very important part of statecraft and the idea of legitimacy and the idea of culture. Who are the people who have the power to read and write and interpret and kind of speak with the ancestors and gain their wisdom? We'll talk more about Chiaguan and writing. Here, example, you can see this extraordinary connection, the oracle bone writing from the Jiaguan from the 10th century BCE. Then in the seal script, the first sort of, you know, marked written script that we find, we see a close association with that. And then even from the 3rd century CE with running script, this is the same character, the character for dragon. And you can start to see the connection between these. It was possible for people when they first discovered oracle bones that they could actually kind of make sense of what they were saying. The language was such, the symbols that were used were a close enough proximity to things that people were familiar with that they were able to read them. Now I compare this to us going to Egypt and being able to read the hieroglyphs. Uh, we lost the ability to read the hieroglyphs. That language was completely um, lost to um, modern civilizations, and it wasn't through some rather extraordinary um, research by archaeologists that were able to piece it together, even when they had this famous Rosetta Stone. This wasn't necessary in China. This was not necessary because the changes of the language in China have been conservative enough that it's been possible to maintain a kind of continuity of knowledge across all these centuries. This is why today in China, they often argue there is this unbroken line of 5,000 years of Chinese culture. Okay, These are all debatable ideas, but it's a very important idea in the present to establish this idea of continuity. And emperors uh, throughout history have often tried to maintain and build upon this idea of this unbroken continuity down through the ages. So what kinds of inscriptions can we find on these Jagoan bones? Things that you often say, D approves of the king to take action. D does not approve the king to take action. Uh, if we do not build a settlement, D will approve. It is not D who is harming our harvest. And so we start to look at these inscriptions and we start to see D being the ancestor deity. We start to see the way in which um, the nobility would have to, their actions were not always condoned. So a powerful sort of maybe priesthood or people who are writing and reading these inscriptions, they have ways of influencing the decisions of the king. And the king then has to uh, decide whether to work against the will of the oracle or not. And so there's all kinds of ways in which these oracles show a really complicated society is dealing with a number of things. There are an awful lot of inscriptions about when the rivers will flood or when the barbarians will invade. And so we see a time of extraordinary turmoil and change that's happening within the society. A little bit more about ancestor worship and how uh, kind of the unique ideas about the sort of cosmology of ancestor worship in ancient China. The basic idea is that there is um, a hung and a hu. When the person dies, their spirit divides in two, part the who, staying in earth to receive offerings, and the hun, 
related to that who is the one that enjoys the company of the gods and the ancestors and is there to sort of, you know, act as a liaison, as a sort of intermediary, communicating with the gods and then bringing blessings and offerings and help back down to earth. And so this kind of connection to the gods comes through your ancestors. Now, in the hierarchy of China, the emperor has the closest proximity to God. They're not God, but they have the closest proximity to God, meaning their offerings and their support goes direct, more directly to the gods and is the gods' fertility is really funneled through that. And that gives the emperor this extraordinary uh, privilege and power in society because the gods have bequeathed the emperor for that role. We see a tremendous amount of wealth and prosperity among the nobility in China from very early on. One of the spectacular tombs that have been discovered recently is the tomb of Lady Fu Hao a woman who was a general in the military who had a high-ranking position and her lavish tomb has filled with an extraordinary array of rich artifacts. So here we have an ivory beaker. It was highly prized in the Shang Dynasty. Okay, so we see this. This is also inlaid with turquoise. In her tomb a total of 1,928 pieces of funeral objects, 400 odd bronze wares, and 700 odd jade wares. Here is a jade of a phoenix, it's intricately carved. Uh, shows again the incredible craftsmanship that comes from this time. Also, along with the tomb artifacts and the body of the uh, noble. We also find um, servants who have been executed and who have been killed to help serve the noble in the afterlife. Okay, we see a sort of similar sort of practice that existed also in Egypt at the same time. Here's a really fascinating object that's mentioned in your textbook, the Kuei tablet, late Neolithic, early Shang Dynasty. So this is a very, very old jade slab that sort of shut into a chisel-like shape. And it has this ancient inscriptions on it, the ancient Shang Dynasty writing. Uh, one side, you can sort of see these kinds of swirling decorative patterns. And on the other side, uh, sort of zoomed in here, you can see an inscription from the Ming Dynasty. And so these inscriptions are a way in which later dynasties would sort of have these objects and inscribe their own authority into them. So these ancient objects were not just something that were delegated to the past. They often, if they were unearthed or discovered or found or traded, they were revered as a kind of indication of the connection between the past and the present and this idea of continuity this very powerful idea of continuity that spans across these many many different dynasties here is the jade b disc uh, this is a, an extraordinary piece of jade work you can see this if you're ever in Kansas City. I highly recommend you go to the Nelson Atkins Museum, where they have one of the finest collections of Chinese art in the country, including this particular uh, piece of jade work with its coiling dragons. This is the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. It's about six and a half inches in diameter, and um, it's just beautiful. It has that ancient symbol of the disc, the symbol of, this, of the sky. But you also know it has this very delicate dimpled pattern across the surface of it. 
The dimple pattern is an indication of how rice is planted in the ground. The wet rice agriculture, they create these little rice seedlings in a, a pattern like this. So when we have, this is both a symbol of fertility of the sky and of the earth, the, the water and the agriculture of rice, which is a symbol of prosperity and wealth. Bronze vessels in the Shang Dynasty take on new significance and play a very important role in ancestor worship. One of the, the great legends of the Shang Dynasty was this idea of the nine cauldrons, nine tripod cauldrons. And these were cauldrons of immense size that the emperor owned that were a part of the way in which they honored the ancestors. Offerings are made in the cauldrons. And so the emperor being the most important member of the clan would and the dynasty would have that connection to the gods and their ability to make grand offerings with nine cauldrons. No one else was allowed to have more cauldrons than the emperor. And this becomes a very important idea uh, in the legitimacy of the emperor. To say to someone today, um, one word is worth nine sacred tripods is an idiom today, which means it's a very flattering way to say the person is very reliable and trustworthy. And when they say something, it means it's true. So this idea of the tripod and a symbol of legitimacy, a symbol of, of emperor's of ability to summon fertility for all the people. On the design of this tripod is an extraordinary mythical beast called the Tauti. Now, the Tauti is a creature that is kind of spread out across the surface of the form. And on the left, you can kind of see how its tail curls back and has a claw and is sort of clearly an eye, a kind of ear and horn and some fangs. Uh, now, the object of the Tauti is, is represented not uh, kind of full frontal with its two eyes facing forward. It's actually sort of spread out across the surface, meaning it's sort of, it's sort of played out. We're seeing both the right side and the left side of this creature at the same time. To make this idea clear, I've shown you half the image of the Tauti to give you an idea of how this creature would look like from one side. But imagine the idea is that we're seeing it sort of become the vessel. The Tauti is the vessel, and the vessel is the Tauti. What does the Tauti mean? Again, the symbolism of the Tauti uh, is extremely prevalent from the Shang Dynasty onward. Perhaps it's an outgrowth of the idea of the pig dragon, a symbol of fertility, a protector. Some people have suggested it morphs to into the dragon. Nobody has ever written about it. It seems to have been such an obvious image or idea that no one felt the need to even explain it anywhere. So we have no writing um, that even so much as mentions or describes their purpose on the vessel. Very interestingly enough, a lot of people have looked to the Northwest Coast Indians, Native American, um, and as a, a, another society that also uses this kind of spread out pattern. Now, the Northwest Coast Indians are related very distantly in the very, very, very distant past. Uh, they passed through the Siberian, arched through Alaska down into the Americas, okay, and so there is a kind of connection. Some people have said or suggested that there is some connection between these two. There is not. It is pure coincidence that these two art styles look so similar. Now, let's talk something about this bronze casting. Bronze casting in China is done in a manner unlike anywhere else in the world. So, they create the object in wax, and then they sort of surround the object with a fine clay so that it picks up all the details of the 
uh, the wax original. And then they sort of support that with these sort of stone mold pieces using the kind of cut the lowest stone, which cuts very easily and can be very precisely cut to create the shapes that sort of hold in the metal wax, the wax that is then going to be burnt out. They then heat the mold and the wax burns out and then uh, the clay hardens so that when the molten bronze is sort of poured into the mold, it fills up and allows for this intricate design. After the it's, it's cooled, you can pop it open and they begin to kind of work and finish the piece and polish it. Now, with this process, each vessel is unique. Every time it's made, there has to be a new wax original. So this is a fairly elaborate process, one that shows that this is something of a, of a of royal privilege, that to be bequeathed the bronze and to bequeath the ability to have one of these vessels is controlled by the emperor, and so that your loyalty to the emperor is rewarded by having these vessels as a sort of demonstration of your fealty to the emperor and your utility as a part of the royal court. On many of these, these bronze vessels on the bottom, uh, we see these extraordinary inscriptions. Bronze vessel inscriptions are added to the vessel after it's been fired using the seal script, which is, in a sense, related to an evolution from the earlier Jiaguan bone oracle script. The seal script here, we start to see a slightly simpler um, form of writing. And we were able to read this, and many of them are sort of honorifics, uh, explaining the occasion uh, uh, for the honor of receiving this bronze vessel, the person who was bequeathed this bronze vessel, and why they were given it. And so we're starting to get uh, a glimpse of the history and the cultural values and ideas from these ancient seal script uh, inscriptions on the bottom of the bronze vessels. Bronze vessels grew and evolved in sophistication over the centuries. We can see the late Shang dynasty here. Um, the shapes are fairly ornate, but fairly blocky as well. The fitting is good, but it's not extraordinary. And then when we see just a few hundred years later, we start to see this amazing sophistication. The forms are more rounded, the polish, the design is richer, crisper, the complexity of the uh, forms is really, truly remarkable. And this only continues uh, with the advances in bronze making technology, that these vessels become ever more complex and sophisticated. So here is a bronze burial set. People of nobility would have not just one bronze vessel, but might have other objects used to hold foodstuffs and offerings. Most often wine was placed inside these, and this would have been a place where uh, prayers and offerings were made to the ancestors. These objects sometimes would be included in the tomb of the person being honored, or sometimes they would be passed on uh, through the generations as a way of, of continually having these objects as a means for honoring the ancestors. The Shang Dynasty also is known for human sacrifice. We've seen uh, actual bodies buried and turned in the tombs, and we also see these sort of ceremonial executioner axes. This bronze axe here has this sort of menacing grimace uh, kind of laughing at you as you are about to be executed. It has this kind of cruel power to it um, that is uh, quite uh, extraordinary. The Shang dynasty was a brutal dynasty, and this idea that people um, were subject to the 
uh, rule of the emperor, an absolute rule. The emperor could command life and death from his subjects at will. Recently, new archaeological discoveries in China have found uh, an extraordinary array of different styles of art. I point this out mostly because it gives a little bit of a pause to the idea that there is a sort of monolithic continuity in Chinese history. Uh, we see the standing figure from Shen, Xin Dui, uh, again in the Shang Dynasty, but from a lesser kingdom, discovered in 1986. Uh, this object with its strange posture, most likely held something like a tusk carved in its center. Um, its elongated figure and its mask-like face are quite distinctive and unique. So the meaning of these objects, um, their importance and significance is again unknown, but it shows uh, a very different style of art that was also happening during this time. Here is um, our last object I want to share with you for this lecture, a bronze mirror. Bronze mirrors were very important in China. They were, again, of symbolic value. Uh, they were also used for applying makeup. Uh, we're seeing the back of the mirror here. There's a spot where a ring of coiled rope where you could hold the mirror. And then the other side of the mirror would be polished smooth so you could see your reflection. The designs on the mirrors usually have uh, a kind of fascinating religious symbol uh, or symbols of prosperity or power. In this case here, we see a tiger coiling around in the object. Again, like the pig dragon, the tiger is another symbol of fertility. And within this tiger, we see other tigers. And we see the tigers move around, except for one of the tigers toward the back is actually more like a lion. Okay, so we have this idea of moving back. Then within each of the tigers, within the tiger, we see this sort of coiling design within them, suggesting within those tigers are other tigers as well. This sort of endless cycle of tigers all the way down. This is a, an incredible idea of this idea of the, the flow of the elements, the flow of the energy and powers of the universe, endlessly recycled, endlessly um, fertility coming to the surface. Let's have a review quiz. Question one, what is the role of ancestor worship? Question two, how are bronze castings made? Question three, what is the significance of jade objects? Question four, what roles did early writing have? Question five, what different kinds of bronze wares were there?